Dr. Beach, are there any announcements that need to be made? All right. So my, my name is Joshua Rhodes. I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Monica Ehrman. Um, Monica is an associate professor of law and faculty director of the Oil and Gas Natural Resources and Energy One Center at the University of Oklahoma College of Law, where she leads the energy program. Her scholarly interests are in the area of oil and gas property issues, the intersection between law and petroleum technology and energy policy. And her courses include oil and gas law, um, international petroleum tra <clears throat> transactions, ener energy negotiations, property oil and gas contracts. She currently um, teaches the JD and graduate programs at OU Law and the Executive Energy Management at OU um, Price College of Business. And prior, I think, I think Monica has a really interesting like, career pathway. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, bring her here today. So prior to teaching, she serves as general counsel for a privately held oil and gas company in Dallas, senior counsel with Pioneer Natural Resources, and associate attorney at Locklord LLP. Her practice um, <clears throat> experience includes oil and gas litigation, energy transactional work. Before law school, Professor Ehrman served as a petroleum engineer in the upstream, midstream, and pipeline sectors of the energy industry. In addition to her experience with the technical aspects of the industry, she also worked as an analyst in the areas of, energy com uh, in the areas of commodity risk management and energy trading. She's a member of the board of directors and the trustee of the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation and trustee for the Energy and Mineral Law Foundation. Um, <clears throat> Professor Ehrman is a faculty advisor of the Oil and Gas uh, Natural Resources Energy One Journal, uh, published by the OU Law. She got her BS, um, Bachelor's of Science in Petroleum Engineering from the University of Alberta, her JD from SMU School of Law, and her Master's in Law from Yale Law School. And we are excited to have her today to talk about the human right to energy. So, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, can everyone hear me all right in the back? And I apologize, you guys. I've got allergies <laughs> tremendously. So I apologize if I um, sound a bit, uh, if I sound like I have allergies, I do. So uh, well, first, thank you so much uh, for this lovely welcome. And thank you so much um, to Dr. Rhodes, to the Energy Institute, and to UT for having me. Diversity, even among the engineers, I know there's diversity among you. We have um, African There we go. All right. Is this one all right? Okay, perfect. All right, so what, what I'm here to talk to you about is something um, about the human right to energy. And from a law perspective, what we would say is, well, maybe we should talk about it from the rights perspective. So what are human rights? What, are, what is the ability to, um, where do we get these human rights from? It's an area, do we call it a privilege? Do we call it a, a right under international law? Is it from a treaty? What is it? That's one aspect. I'm not particularly interested in the origin of the human right. I'm interested in the need for the human right to, for energy. So earlier um, today and earlier this week, I've, you know, as an academic, we sit in on these presentations and we listen to people and we ask questions and it's a kind of a wonderful part of this job. And so one of the conversations that I participated in earlier was about the transition to a new renewable energy future. And the speaker actually wasn't talking about this transition. The speaker was talking about natural gas, was talking about electric power, a really interesting presentation on the mechanics of this, and maybe some of the challenges that we face within the pricing system. And one of the questions came up was, well, should we be focusing so much on those applications, and why aren't we focusing more on this transition to the renewable future? And again, 
It's an important question. So there's no, um, I mean, there's just, without doubt, climate change is going to be one of the biggest challenges that humans and humankind face. It's going to be the, the challenge of your generation, the moonshot of this current generation, this population. So there's no doubt that that is going to happen and that it is not a huge sort of existential threat that faces us. But what I thought was interesting is we're so interested, so ready to move to this new energy future, we haven't thought about who currently participates in the current energy future and what populations don't participate at all, which goes to this human right to energy. And so one of the questions that I want to make sure we ask ourselves is before we advance ahead, before we know where we are going, do we know where we have been? And so I start, like all good stories, at the beginning. And I'll start at the beginning of one of my favorite Texas stories, which is Lonesome Duff. And it's Larry McMurtry's phenomenal tale of just Texan tenacity, the drive of cattle up to sort of the northern states. And it starts with a step over the Rio Grande River, because that's how small the Rio Grande River was, and then moving all of this cattle up, up through Fort Worth to the stockyards, crossing the Red River, camping out, facing balls of rattlesnakes, the weather conditions. You have no control over climate. You have no control over these adverse conditions, medical, disability, injuries, life come, expectancy. All of this, what we take for granted today, we didn't have that luxury. So Little House on the Prairie, all of these tales that we tell of people who gather wood, who build shelter by hand, who move animals, who move livestock for the foundation for their livelihoods. All of that we tell today in America as stories. But for much of the rest of the world, it's a daily life reality. It's not a story that they tell. It's a life that they're living. So the idea with the human right to energy is we start at the foundation of energy poverty. And I know one of your um, speakers um, has already come to speak to you, and I believe that was the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute. So I'm not going to focus too much on, obviously, Texas poverty. I think your speaker did a fantastic job of outlining the challenges that sort of um, NGOs face in addressing a very critical situation. What I'm here to talk about is something is to sort of pull it back. Bigger picture for energy poverty. We'll also look at energy poverty. It comes with energy insecurity, which is the inability to access sufficient or reliable amounts of power. And then talk about this energy as a human right. We'll also look at some of the barriers to energy development. And so for the engineers, the social scientists, for those of you that will go on and participate in the solutions to these challenges, it's you. It's you who will have the solutions, even though I have it up here on my PowerPoint. It's actually you who are going to provide these solutions. I'll present some of these challenges, and it'll be up to you to kind of craft the future. So here in Texas, and because my focus is oil and gas law, I love starting with this map. And this map is, is just one of my favorite energy maps. It's the map that shows the American electric power from space. But in particular, it shows this, this little, um, I don't know if this is a pointer. It shows in the circle the Bakken formation. So here is the slide. Here is the picture where we saw the Bakken Shale in North Dakota, we saw this formation from space. So are we actually looking at the formation? No, it's just lights. So where are these lights coming from? If they're not coming from Minneapolis, St. Paul, Chicago, we see our golden triangle below in Texas of Dallas, Houston, Austin. These we all associate with big sort of cities, municipal development. So why can we see the Bakken formation from space? This picture came out probably at the very kind of early onset of shale development in the, in the uh, Bakken. It's because of flaring. It's also because of rig lights. There's also sort of nighttime operations. But much of this came from flaring. So what's natural gas flaring? Natural gas flaring is associated with a lack of capacity. It's a lack of transportation takeaway capacity. So I have so much production 
that comes from this sort of shale production, and that comes from when I produce oil and gas from the subsurface, I'm either going to have associated amounts of methane that comes up with this sort of oil, and that methane then either has to be captured, it's a saleable product, or if I don't have a mechanism in which to transport it, I don't have a pipeline, and LNG is too expensive a proposition to kind of put on shore. So if I don't have that choice, I don't have a pipeline, well, I have to flare it. I have to get rid of it. And so a saleable product, methane, which is the main component in natural gas, becomes a waste product. So that's one sort of failure from the engineering system. But is it a failure of engineering? Is it that we just don't know how to build pipelines? Yeah, of course we know how to build pipelines. So that's where we bring in the other aspects that go to energy development, where energy development and energy infrastructure build out has really become community and local development, local build out along a national or international route. So what once was something maybe local, I get permitting from the appropriate agency, maybe it, it's uh, interstate borders, so there's some sort of FERC, you know, um, interstate access that I need to get. Now it becomes a challenge to try to get communities to buy into infrastructure projects. And so the Dakota Access Pipeline is an example of that. And what is happening um, in Colorado with sort of voter ballot initiatives and legislature, um, with legislative bills. But here what we have is not a community that is just anti-oil and gas, anti-pipeline. It's anti-externalities, the negative externalities associated with energy infrastructure build out. And I think that's an important part of the communication. And so here, if we have as a result no pipeline takeaway capacity and we have to flare methane, well, that's not a good thing either. So being good engineers, being just good social citizens, being good community members, make sure that we listen to each other in these communications. But back to our space map, right? Back to the Bakken shale from space. So what we can see here is this Bakken shale. Now what we also see then, so in addition to this sort of story of pipeline incapacity or lack of take takeaway capacity and also sort of community, you know, the, the need for community communication and stakeholder participation in these energy projects, the other thing we see is an absence of light, an absence of electricity. And that's in the sort of western half of the state. So if we look at this map, we could make two assumptions, right? Or two, we could come to two conclusions. One conclusion could just be, well, the western half of the United States is not electrified. That's a possible conclusion, except certain areas of population. Or the second conclusion is there's just not a lot of population in the western half of the United States, which is why we don't see a lot of electricity, a lot of light. Now, take this map, the Bakken from space, and we juxtapose it with this international map of light, of electricity. And we can't come to the same conclusion here. Because when we look at Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, we look at some parts of South America, but mostly sub-Saharan Africa in these regions, much of it is populated. So it's not that there is not or there is an absence of population. Here what we have is the absence of power, the absence of electricity. And so what we see here is about 1.3 billion people in the world don't have access to power. So that is the energy poverty that we speak of. And your speaker, who you heard earlier in October, talking about from a Texas perspective, either goes to maybe a lack of power, but more the insecurity or inability to economically afford power. Here we're talking about complete absence. So almost or one seventh of the population of the world without access to power. And what's interesting too, from a resource perspective, is who is without power. So we look at some of these countries like Angola, where 60% of the world, or 60% of the country is without power, and other countries like Botswana, 40%, but in particular Ghana, Nigeria, very, very high proportions of the population without power. Now what is really interesting about those statistics 
because otherwise they're just numbers. What's really interesting about that is Angola, Nigeria, Ghana are resource rich. Very, very oil rich countries. So these are countries where international oil companies have come in to partner either with the host government or with the um, national oil company for amazing onshore, mostly offshore development. So Ghana was the recent site of an incredible offshore find that was pioneered by a local company in Dallas called Cosmos Energy. For those of you that like watching big men or like watching documentaries on Netflix rather, I would suggest to you the documentary Big Men, which is this phenomenal tale of a Dallas independent that goes to find the Jubilee oil field in offshore Ghana and bringing in one of the world's just you know, most amazing offshore discoveries. But why those countries then? If you're so resource rich, why can't our populations have easy access to power? Any access to power, and that goes to the resource curse. So you, you've succumbed to the resource curse. And for those of you that have kind of followed either in the international petroleum or the resource area, know the resource curse is when one industry, usually extractive industry focused, becomes so dominant, becomes the dominant industry, that no resources are allocated to develop other burgeoning or potential industries. So all the resources go to focus on the one behemoth extractive industry, and then therefore the entire country's, um, the country then rises and falls along with, in this case, commodity prices. I'm so sorry, that is now recorded for posterity. So, <coughs> excuse me, you guys. So, what we have then are these resource rich countries who don't have access to power. And what we can look to then in development for international models, for petroleum models, people look to something called the Norwegian model. So, what's the Norwegian model? The Norwegian model is the model when Norway brought in its um, North Sea oil fields. And that was done with one of our American independents, with Phillips Petroleum Company, who got this concession, or license rather, to go out to the North Sea and had this contract to drill, and I believe it was 12 or 13 wells, but I might be mistaken, and drilled dry hole after dry hole after dry hole, and was just about to give up on the North Sea and drilled their last well and brought in the discovery well. So it's a really phenomenal story here. So they looked at this Norwegian model as, well, let's take the revenue generated from this resource and then we invest it for the benefit of the citizens of Norway. So much of the infrastructure of Norway has been paid for with the revenues generated by offshore oil development. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important now because Statoil, the once National Oil Company of Norway, it's a, privately co it's a private company, or publicly traded company, but that company has now changed its name to Equinor, so no longer does the oil name remain there, but also the um, Norwegians have committed to a goal of decarbonization. So why have they committed to this goal of decarbonization? The Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund no longer will make investments in oil and gas. So why is this? this this whole country where so much of its infrastructure, its very rich infrastructure, was generated by oil revenue. Why is it that now it will not do so? Because it has hydro. It has an alternate source of energy. So I would put to you, when we think about energy poverty, and in this sort of transitionary period where we have these sort of forerunners, people who are excited, and rightly so, about moving away from sort of carbon fuels, they have access plentiful, abundant, reliable access usually to another energy source. So what happens then to these other people who are still using biofuels to cook? And that gap then between the energy haves and the energy have not kind of widen. So it's just a, a question or, or really a, an observation to sort of keep in mind as you work towards the sort of energy transition problem. Because energy poverty would be easy to kind of roll, you know, sort of statistic after statistic about energy poverty. And we've already talked about Norway and its transition into the sort of hydro future. 
powering, generating so much electricity that they're able to export electricity to the continent. So that's an abundance of power. And what happens to people who don't have an abundance of power, who don't have power, who are relying on kerosene for studying, what happens to the outcomes of those populations? Think about the learning outcomes. If you left this room, went back to your homes, and had no electricity by which to study, or didn't have access to laptops or whatever kind of equipment, because maybe you had a battery, but you need to charge your battery at some point. So the idea then about your learning outcome, how much would you learn? How well would you learn? So these, the lack of then of electricity really generates not just the problem, immediate problem of food, of shelter, but these long-term population problems that countries have to, um, have to sort of think about. So they have to think about what happens to our populations where students can't study at night or where students have no access to electricity. Forget about um, not having 4G access throughout a national grid. What if you just don't have access, period? The other problem that's associated with a lack of sort of fuel, of poverty, or, the, or with fuel poverty rather, is the idea of cook stoves. So the cook stoves is really a sort of, we look at this and we think, oh, okay, well, you know, everybody saw this. This is the idea of Little House on the Prairie. We just go outside, we collect biofuels, and we burn them, and then we cook our food on them, right? And we associate maybe with camping. It's a fun, recreational activity. It's something we choose to do. We choose to gather fuel. We choose to burn it. We roast our s'mores. We're excited to be doing this. But for 2 billion people across the world, it's not a choice. This is how you cook. And the disproportionate share of these health burdens or health outcomes that result from cooking daily, multiple times a day, hours in the kitchen with poor ventilation, are borne by women. <coughs> And so then again, we have these outcomes that are disproportionately affect not only people from certain countries, but also gender. So it's women who are disproportionately affected. And so again, I put the pictures up because we relate better to people. We relate better when we see images of people as opposed to just statistics like 4,000 people a day are dying from the effects of cookstoves. And so the Gates Foundations, I mean, lots of foundations are doing work into providing things like LPG, so sort of a, a liquefied petroleum gas, and so people can have easier, healthier access to cooking. Because this energy, this fuel poverty, doesn't just go to the health impacts. It doesn't just go to the idea of, of constantly wondering, well, how am I going to cook? But it goes to where am I going to gather the fuel to cook? So the idea of providing LPG to communities, this is a huge step forward in securing access to energy. Because otherwise, I have to dedicate hours a day, and again, usually disproportionately borne by women or by girls who we pull out of the educational stream to go and look for energy, to go and look for fuel. So these populations, and, and so there have been a, a number of studies done, if we look at the populations who are constantly sort of searching for fuel, and if we pulled them out, the amount of workforce capacity that's taken away is dramatic. So how are countries supposed to advance you know, with technology? How are they supposed to be the space age? We're thinking about launching um, humans back to the moon, go forth on Mars, we're looking at mining on asteroids, we saw our first picture of a black hole, all of these momentous, incredible leap forwards are happening, and meanwhile, we still have a population, huge portions of our population, searching for wood to burn, to cook. So the other types of poverty that are associated with energy poverty include water and food. And this is an important conversation that, as resource scholars, we have because energy is not independent from food, is not independent from water. So we call this the energy, food, water nexus. And together, these things are, are sort of linked. So when I don't have access to energy, how do I have access to sort of pipeline systems? 
right? Plastic poly pipe for distribution of water, purification for those of you that are chemical engineering or civil engineers, the idea of purification and transportation of water, the idea of pumping mechanisms. I need mechanical energy to sort of pump water so I can distribute it to local populations. And if I don't do that, then I have to put it on a truck and transport water. So the idea here is that water is tied to energy and is tied to food. So without sort of access to energy, from which we might have fertilizers, diesel equipment, tractors, machinery, things to sort of grow commercial scale abundance of food in which to feed populations, all of that sort of comes together in this triad of food, energy, and water, either scarcity or poverty or insecurity. And we've talked to already about the sort of ramification and impacts of gender and poverty in this. So that's the idea of the sort of social poverty basis. But poverty isn't just abroad. And again, you've had a speaker who's, who's talked to you about Texas poverty. And that's the thing to remember when we look at this sort of poverty. Poverty doesn't discriminate. So you can have poverty, and in certainly we have poverty here. I know on campus that's one of the things we talk about, is students who don't have access to sort of reliable amounts of food, and making sure that students do have that access. So the idea of American energy poverty means that in this county, which is one of the poorest counties in the country, this is in Kentucky, here we have a little boy seated in his uncle's cabin, and there we see there's no running water in this cabin, and there's the cook stove. So there's our Larry McMurtry driving the cattle north, little house on the prairie, cook stove we just saw used by women. Here's the cook stove that's used for heat and for food. So we have that here in this country, and these solutions, or these problems rather, need solutions. So one of the things that we focus on in Oklahoma a lot, we have a very strong indigenous peoples um, population, and so a lot of our institutions academically, we focus on indigenous peoples law. So here when we look at either you know, the First Nations, indigenous peoples, but growing up in Indian country usually means that your ability to access energy is not as easy as populations outside of Indian country. And so poverty on tr in tribes Poverty in certain reservations, it is exacerbated also by these other sort of educational, um, educational, social, I mean, a, a lot of sort of social infrastructure and, and lack of infrastructure. So here, this is a picture of the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, and this is a, a branch of the Ogallala Sioux people. And what we have are these children standing beside a wood pile. And again, back to the wood back to people gathering wood. Here there is a truck that will drop off firewood for you. And so that lack of access in this country in 2019, when we are so excited about seeing black holes from space, we still have populations who constantly are thinking about where are we going to get heat and where are we going to get fuel to cook. So the, the example too, and this goes to, this is sort of off topic for me, but the idea of resiliency and design, I think it's a really interesting um, area. So the idea of resiliency is, are we designing systems, whether it's residential systems, whether it's community systems, but are we looking at systems and thinking about resiliency? So in terms of increased sort of climate change impacts, so for those of you interested in sort of coastal building, coastal development, how do you design these systems that are resilient for climate change? Here, how do we design systems for people who live in sort of lower income areas, may not have access to you know, um, uh, either sort of clean systems of electricity or water? How do you get water? How do you get food? How do you get power to these communities? How do you design housing so that it can stay insulated and it requires less energy to heat? So that's the idea of making sure that you address resiliency when we look at these solutions. Because the solution just isn't, well, let's just put a, a wire in the ground and then we'll run electrons through it, problem solved, right? We have to think about all the steps before, all the steps after, but 
it's really looking at it from a systems perspective. So the idea of energy poverty, and I, and I won't go into this um, too much here, because again, I know you've had your speaker, but the idea is that these low-income families, they have to sustain a very high energy burden. And so transportation goes to this idea of resiliency. So if I have poor access to transportation, and so it takes me two hours to get to my job, or I have unreliable access to transportation, and then I can't get to my job, I'm laid off from my job, and then I can't pay my power bill. Or I have to choose between paying for groceries or paying for power, which for in America, what we call that situation is usually heat or eat. It's the sort of binary choice, really a terrible binary. And what's so fantastic, though, is that institutions like UT, partnering with the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute, are looking at these problems. And you will look at these problems in your capacity. So now we get to our human right to energy. So what is that? Well, we've got this declaration of human rights through the United Nations. And the United Nations has also developed something called sustainable development goals. And one of those sustainable development goals doesn't speak to energy, but goes to this access for health, social well-being. And I would argue that the right to energy, this human right to energy, falls under that United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. So this right to sort of well-being, social well-being, good medical health, all of this starts, at least from our perspective and maybe in this class, starts with energy. So when we look at, at human rights, again, I, I wanted to just point this out to you because I come from the College of Law, so I'm going to talk a little bit of law, but this is not my focus here. But we have this idea of human rights. So the idea of human rights, again, this is from the United Nations. I won't read to you, but where do they originate? We have this idea that they originate from law, so we grant you rights. So in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments, we grant you certain rights. There's another aspect, and some say that the moral, sort of moral origin of these rights is sort of built into our Constitution. The Constitution thus recognizes moral rights, is they come from the sort of natural law. It's humans are sort of naturally entitled to it. So that's kind of the philosophical origin. But I, I won't focus too much. I just think it's interesting. Now this goes to the challenges then. So we talked about all these problems, right? Okay. People don't have electricity. We talked about that, OK? Well, there are some places where they have so much energy, they're burning it. And you can see the lights from space because they don't have uh, capacity takeaway. OK, we talked about that. That's kind of infrastructure. Then we looked at Norway. We jumped to Norway. And we said, man, some people have abundant amounts of other sort of um, no carbon or zero carbon um, access. So they have access to hydro. So they have so much energy. They can choose to move away from an existing source, and they can export energy. They can generate revenue. They have so much abundance. And then we looked at these huge portions of the population, right, almost a seventh of our world's population, where there's no electrons. There's no wires. Nothing's flowing. I'm still looking and using my energy day to day in looking for the things that pioneers did 200 years ago here. So, how do we solve all that, right? That goes to the solutions. Well, I think as any of us could tell you, there really aren't any solutions. I know you're thinking, well, that's not much of a conclusion. Here are the thing. There's not one solution. There are many solutions. Again, to look at it from this sort of systems approach, you have to look at it from different perspectives. What we are not good at, or especially not good at, is that we think very siloed. So we look at it as engineers either from, it's an engineering problem, right? There's a generation problem. So we look at our sort of existing system of electricity. And here we've got generation. This is really simple. And then, OK, it's like the interstate highway. I need the access road. I need to sort of accelerate to get on the interstate. So I have some sort of transformer that accelerates. And then I transmit it. I have this sort of aging electric power system which I think is one of the most phenomenal inventions of the 20th century. But I have this amazing electric system that will carry electrons across the country, across the continent in some cases. And then 
Again, I get off the interstate, I go back down this access road, and then I have local distribution lines. So you see that from generation to distribution, or generation to transmission to local distribution. And this is the model we use. And it's very linear. It's a very linear model. And I'm not talking about all the spokes and pathways of energy. But is there another way to look at that? Because this model is expensive. This is a really expensive model, which is why I can't just take this model and plunk it down in sub-Saharan Africa and say, you too have power. All you got to do is build out this totally expensive um, infrastructure. And oh, by the way, you need some sort of uh, rate-based system, cost of service system. You need that way to pay for it. That's how we do it. And then classify the whole thing a public utility and then call it a day. Oh, and by the way, there's markets. That doesn't translate very well. So the idea here, when we look at this, are, are there other ways? And again, this just goes back to that sort of linear kind of system. Is, is there a better way to transmit? So here the idea of looking at the brain, at neural networks, right? So looking at this sort of network way to sort of disseminate energy. For those of you that are interested in inventions, the idea is their way to do sort of small steps forward. So there was a, a project, and I can't remember the name of the project, but it was a soccer ball. And the idea here is we take kinetic energy and then we transform kinetic energy into power, right, into light, into light energy. So I take all the, the soccer ball, and the soccer ball is just played with, the kids play with it, and at night I can hang this up and it becomes a light source for the family. But that's, that's really micro, right? So now we look at, instead of these huge, huge projects, are there smaller sort of micro projects that we can put in place that have solutions? So the idea for power from the engineering invention perspective is, well, it's really expensive to purify water. It's really expensive to transport water, and it's really expensive to distribute water using our linear system, right? We have a source of water, we take it for some kind of purification, we put it in pipes, and we have some sort of trunk line, and then we have local distribution lines. Again, very linear thinking. So the idea with water is, well, and this was our OU has a big sort of water conference, and they give out a water prize. And one of the prizes was this sort of bar, and it has some sort of silver ions. So it has silver, rather. And so this silver is mixed in with this wood ash. It's just a waste product. And you mix it in, and I'm simplifying this, and it turns into a bar. And you take that bar, and you put it in your container of water, and you let it sit overnight, and it purifies the water. And it costs less than $5, and it lasts about a month. That's life-changing for like cleaning water and transporting water, and not having to go to look for clean water, but to be able to take water you have and then clean it yourself at home for low cost with low technology. So those are the kind of innovations that we look to. So again, we talked about this sort of massive infrastructure and whether or not this is a repeatable, um, whether or not this is repeatable, probably not. It's just very expensive. So what are some more challenges? Well, you will come to learn um, in your professional careers and especially if you're in academia, funding. Funding is a huge problem. So where do we get the money to pay for this? Who pays for these projects? So right now we pass it off on the consumer, right? We have these rate-based systems. So what do I do then? Also, back to our climate change. What do we do about the idea that we need to move forward, that we need to address sort of climate change, and we need to sort of not just mitigate the impacts, but sort of prevent more? So the, these questions here go into those sort of systems frameworks about looking at it, not only from the technical solution, not only from the ability to implement, but also from environmental perspectives, from cost perspectives. So a good example of that this is still a problem, this is, the, um, this is Puerto Rico. So here we have hurricanes, a series of hurricanes that blew in, and we have damage to the electric transmission system. So much of the country was without power, or and I should, much of the territory was without power. So here we have an American territory 2017, I believe, is when this picture was taken, without access to power. And in Puerto Rico's case, what was so 
I guess, interesting from a um, energy standpoint, it wasn't the generation facilities that were damaged. They were resilient, to go back to our theme of resiliency, but they were resilient to the storm. What was damaged was the transmission lines. So here we have this idea of, is there a better way to transmit electricity without using this sort of linear system of lines? But again, in 2017, without power, in the aftermath of the storm, here we have American citizens doing laundry in the water, and here we have them in the long queues. And for those of you that either remember or have read about the sort of long queues in the oil embargo days in the 1970s where people sort of lined up for fuel. So here we have it happening in 2017. So what are some more of these sort of challenges? Well, climate change obviously is going to be a massive challenge. It is a massive challenge. And one of the biggest problems, I think, with climate change is that it's very existential in nature. So as humans, we've evolved to be responsive to local and immediate threats. So there is drought and there is no food in this area. I must move on. Or there is some sort of storm coming, fire approaches, there's a predator coming. So we respond to sort of local and immediate impacts. And the idea with climate change is that it is so much bigger than any sort of one group of population or one sort of society can grasp. It's very, very hard to then coordinate because the response to climate change needs to be a coordinated response. And in order for there to be coordination, I need to have these sort of network groups that work together and recognize this threat. And that's, that's very difficult to do. It's one of the biggest challenges, I think. So again, I talked about solutions at the beginning, but I really put to you that you guys have the solutions, that you students, you are the ones that are going to craft the solutions or at least implement policies that address this problem. And so you can look to the development goals. I mean, obviously, if you think about all of these problems, how do we pay for it? I have on here carbon tax. That's more sort of wishful thinking. It's very, very difficult in this sort of any legislative climate, ask George Bush, but taxes are hard to put in place. And so whether you have, as the Climate Leadership Council under former Secretary Baker has kind of proposed, whether you intend to do it in form of a dividend, so there isn't a, a sort of taxation as a revenue stream for the country, rather it's done on a dividend basis, it's just really hard for the solution um, to, to kind of go forth. But it brings it back to how do we pay for all of this? But again, looking at the sort of cooperative solutions. And I'm a big fan of the technology of wizards, that there will be sort of climate mitigation in the form of sequestration or removable. I've seen that there's this new technology. Um, I just read about it, removing atmospheric carbon dioxide and then transforming it, kind of a coalification problem back, or uh, process back into sort of solid carbon. So I, I just read about that. But I'm also a big sort of believer in technology too. But those are my comments for you guys. And thank you so much for your time and this invitation. said Bill Gates created like an organization um, to help people that don't have a lot of energy. Do you, um, what was that called again? The Gates Foundation. So they've invested a lot of um, research and funding into sort of um, the sort of fuel poverty issue. Hi. Um, so I know you said Obviously, source to sink kind of conventional thinking is the most expensive or is a massive expensive endeavor, but at the same time, kind of on a per kilowatt basis, distributed generation options aren't really much better. So, what 
is out there in sort in sort of terms or suggestions to sort of rectify this? I know like discounting the reliability factor because it's a lot of the expense drivers. We have to have energy a hundred percent of the time. But what what ideas are out there to sort of meet that? So if you're thinking about um, new sources, and here I would encourage our experts too to offer their incredible advice. They study in this field, but. Um, there's lots of like interesting sort of energy sources, right? Energy is just really the transformation from one form of energy to another. So things like um, like tide, right? Using sort of tides as sort of a mechanism, tidal energy. I think that's really interesting. Wind energy. I mean, the economics on wind. I mean, all of these um, uh, sort of renewable sources. The economics are getting better and better. And I won't go into sort of the idea of subsidies too. I'm just going to um, talk about them generally. But I think there's there's I think there's room to grow in what we have and establish as sort of renewable platforms and renewable technologies. I think the idea of sort of microgrids and distributed generation is really interesting. The only sort of caveat or cautionary tale that I would, um, that I would speak as to sort of the idea of distributive generation is that it really takes away from how we fund the sort of public utility model. So if I'm allowed to put solar panels on my roof and I'm allowed to draw down on that energy and also sort of sell back to the market, then my incentive then to be connected to sort of the major utility, right, and pay utility rates and all of that, well, I'm kind of disincentivized to do that. And so as more people withdraw from the utility system, then the cost goes up for the rest who sort of bear that share, which then may provide a greater incentive to disconnect from the grid. So that's just one thing to sort of think about because the, um, what utilities provide is utilities usually provide discounted power to low income groups. So utilities, because they're able to sort of buy on sort of a mass scale, mass basis, they have these sort of discounted rates of power that you're able to go forward and purchase, you know, 30 years in advance or whatever. And so if I all of a sudden have to have a sort of lower um, if I have a sort of a lower population on which to sort of pass or lose, fewer amount of users that I can pass my rates off onto, then I'm kind of disincentivized to sort of provide low cost power um, to sort of these lower income groups. So that's one of the one issue I think with distributive generation. Again, I know that there are experts who study in this field. Dr. Rhodes? I, I think a, a lot of that has to do with what you know, the intensity of power that you need. Like if you will have a heavy duty, like, you know, manufacturing facility, it's going to be hard to, you know, get that on distributed, you know, power, like a smelting facility or, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I think, um, yeah, I think, I, I, I think it depends on what you want. Light can be easy, but, um, you know, heavy industry, it can be a lot harder to do that um, from like a, like the, how we traditionally think of like renewables being, you know, with solar panels on the roof or things like that. Um, uh, I had a question about just basic definition of human rights. So is there any, are, are there any instances of interpretation by any country where they include energy in that realm of what you were speaking or is that United Nations taking, um, making an effort to kind of amend how, change how people think about that? And then you gave an example about Norway uh, that is again a policy which the government implemented that doesn't necessarily mean that it's part of the uh, human rights or someone can actually question uh, if they do not have electricity kind of go to the government and be like I kind of demand that so is that is do you think that can happen in, or is there any instance of that happening so for your first question I don't know um, I don't know the answer if there is a country that has adopted a right to energy as part of its um, interpretation of human rights, so I don't know the answer to that. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals don't talk about energy specifically, so it kind of comes under this umbrella of sort of social goals, and I think it's, oh, I can't remember, if you could say, if you give me your email, I can email you, I think it's like Article 25 of this Sustainable Development Goals, but I don't quite remember, but they don't talk about that in terms of energy. What they talk about it is all of the sort of results that come 
with sustainable energy, with reliable energy, with access to energy, I think. So health outcomes, social outcomes, educational outcomes, all of that, I would argue to you, requires energy. To your second question, and my apologies if I don't um, quite address it, the human rights, so maybe you could repeat your question, the second question. Oh, I see. I see your question. So here's the thing, right? What is considered a right is, depends right, on the population. And so if I have a population that is tremendously wealthy, comparatively, remember there's always groups within the population that are not. But generally speaking, if I have a population that is wealthy, for whom energy is not a concern, then I may not consider that I, I may not even consider whether or not that right needs to be a part of my policy because it doesn't really come up in my population. And there, for democracies, it's not coming up as part of that civic participation, right, that sort of dialogue. So I think it probably depends on the population. So here everybody agrees we need, so if you were just to turn off all the lights in Norway, they would say, my goodness, we have a right to energy. But I think what the, when, I, when I was giving the example of Norway transitioning to this sort of zero carbon, non-extractive future, here it goes really to the abundance of supply of energy in another form, that they have the ability to make that transition, they have the ability to make that decision because they have a reliable, abundant source of energy to go to. A quick question, which is, um, Sometimes law or regulations has counterproductive impacts on our ability to say like distribute energy and address issues like energy poverty. So one thing that comes to mind is like the Jones Act, um, our, our, our limitations on um, what, what ships are allowed to basically carry energy in the United States or around our, our shorelines. Um, can you think of any other, um, not being a legal scholar, um, I'm a mechanical engineer by background, and um, can you think of any other local, state, federal, or like international laws and stuff that we should be aware of that are almost from a counterproductive standpoint impacting and, and actually causing energy poverty more so than we would probably, I mean, things that we should be aware of just to try to eliminate? Oh my goodness. That's I mean, I'm a, sure there's endless, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a terrific question. And I don't know that I can just sort of um, address any one particular, you know, I, I don't know that energy poverty is probably a result of any one cause, but sure. probably yeah. the aggregation of these causes, but even to sort of give you some of the aggregation of cause, let's see, from a, as an, you were, were looking for examples. Well, just if there was anything off the top of your mind, like if we're unable to, um, you know, trade with certain uh, African countries or unable to, um, you know, build our building codes, if there was anything that you could think of that is keeping somebody from, you know, I think of uh, construction in the Bay Area, for instance, inability to build apartment complexes because, you know, of, of building regulations and such and, and just local resistance to it. I think of that type of stuff when I think of energy poverty and their inability to get a roof over their head, right? Yeah, so I just absolutely. don't know. If there are any other things that were on your radar that you thought were particularly relevant to I this I think the issue. Bay Area example is really interesting because it goes to the sort of um, the sort of, I think San Francisco just surpassed New York as the most expensive place, the most expensive real estate now in the country. And so the idea in sort of the Bay Area is that I'm attracting all of this talent to the Bay Area. I have all these incredible tech companies that pay well, but I still have people who can't afford to live or can't afford to take those jobs because, so you have this sort of intellectual capital you're losing, right? The sort of ability to attract employees because they can't afford to live where the company is headquartered. But really the sort of rising real estate prices then affects those who are most marginalized, right? Like those sort of low income people who couldn't even afford to live there in the first place. And that, back to your question about 
Are there things we can look at? It goes to San Francisco zoning. So a lot of the zoning in San Francisco, and to my knowledge, is driven by this need for sort of single family housing which is why you have these really narrow kind of single family home structure because the most efficient model to house people, right, and cost effective is multifamily units. And multifamily units have this sort of um, negative connotation that came up when you had the sort of uh, flight to the suburbs post-World War II. I mean, this whole sort of urban history of the creation of the suburbs, what that did to sort of the cities, inner cities, public schools that were funded by these populations. I mean, every one of those caused an event that you can now look at and say has caused some kind of poverty. But that zoning, I mean, if San Francisco just rezoned and said, sure, put up big apartment buildings, put up big common spaces that we can all sort of use and live, that would probably do a lot. But it affects real estate prices. Who benefits from high real estate prices? So it's hard to, it's hard to move. That's one example. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I am an LLM student from Mexico. Uh, uh, I, am, I am a little concerned about the situation that Mexico is going, on, going right now uh, with the new president that is supporting coal and has stopped like the projects that were originally sponsored by the Mexican government in the long-term long auctions for the development of renewable projects. So. Uh, what many people used to do is considering, for example, education as a human right and to demand that to the government to construct uh, schools, to construct uh, infrastructure. But also uh, there is this uh, concept in the Mexican Constitution that a uh, population has a right to a clean environment and those uh, uh, renewable energies are like relevant. But my question is, in your opinion, in order to continue the investments in the renewable energies in in Mexico, uh, who should be like the who should take like the the, the first action? The investors uh, recurring to international uh, funds, for example, the Paris, Mexico is part of the Paris Agreement, and the mechanisms that there may be implemented. The investors should go to the international uh, stages, or the population should demand to the government that as a human right. Who should take the first step, the investors or the population? So you've got this um, in economics, the simple way, it's called the chicken, chicken and egg dilemma here, right? So, and, and first to your question, I'm not familiar with um, uh, sort of Mexican, the political situation right now or any of these. So I'm speaking kind of generally from international um, just from international typical policy. Everything back to the law, I mean, you know the answer as a lawyer, it's, it depends, right? So the thing here for international is so much of it depends. If you look at it, I'll step back. What do we need for all of these to work from the sort of economics perspective? Efficiency, right? We need efficient systems. So what do you need in order for a government to be responsive to its citizens? I need efficient sort of civic electoral participation. Right? I need fair elections. I need some sort of process where there's representation of people by the government. I need the government to listen to the people. And so you take the sort of corollary example of Venezuela, right? another sort of resource curse com you know, country, and sort of all of those kind of political failings and what's going on with Venezuela. And then you go back to sort of what, what can we learn from the sort of resource curse, and then what sort of best practice, but I think you're asking is what should we do now, not what's best practice. But the question, I think the answer is still it depends, right? It depends on the electoral process. The other thing it depends on is that if I want international investment, I need some sort of guarantee of risk, right? So the idea of mitigating risk in transactions either goes to, so when Mexico amended the Constitution to allow companies other than Pemex, sort of international oil development to move in, well, that took kind of constitutional amendment. So sometimes it just depends on what is it you're trying to attract. If I'm trying to attract international participation, private enterprise to come, well, I need to kind of guarantee either a return of my capital, right? You think about repatriation and all of those risks. The other thing is just straight mitigation of risk. So political risk, capital risk, I need to make sure that I have, um, you know, sort of sophisticated labor who's 
who can work on my projects or else bring them. I, I think there's just many factors to that. I don't know that there's maybe a which comes first in that. So. Um, for example, in the case of the Paris Agreement, do you think that in the near future the UN will have the necessary strength to enforce uh, the, this, you know, international law is really may some people think that it's enforceable, others that it's not really enforceable, just commitments or good good wish letters. But uh, do you think that the UN in the future, uh, with regards to the climate, the Paris Agreement, I mean, uh, would have the necessary power to enforce this against the countries or? What's, what's, what's the role in the future for the Paris Agreement, in your opinion? Uh, I'm, I'm not a scholar for international environmental law, so I don't think I can answer your question. But I can tell you maybe that another part of the solution is not going to be the sort of global cooperative sort of framework for these solutions, but looking at things from a local level. So the idea for microplastics, which has become a big problem for oceans, fisheries, marine health, human health, like we've now ingested microplastics and we don't even know the impact of, of plastics in sort of the human system. So the idea here is maybe those can be addressed by local, um, local communities. And um, there's a professor at NYU, um, Katrina Wyman, and she has a doctoral student she's working with. And so she's an international environmental law scholar. And so she's one of, she just presented a paper, a great paper last week looking at, well, instead of looking at these kind of international cooperative solutions, should we be looking for some of these problems at least, maybe not just climate change, but looking at the actual um, issues that arise, so drought, wildfire, rising sea levels, and in, in her paper she spoke specifically about microplastics, but looking at them at a local level instead of this international level. So maybe um, looking at her work. She's an excellent scholar. Well, uh, <clears throat> at a, I was curious a little bit more about the resource curse, and if I was wondering if you could maybe go in a little bit deeper about, or you know, how 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 does how does a developing country kind of overcome it? And I try to think of it in terms of like, well, I mean, the U.S. went through a whole bunch of, um, you know, back when Standard Oil, you know, had 90% of oil production in the U.S., but we also weren't exporting it elsewhere, so we needed our, our the people here in the U.S. to be rich so they could buy it so that money could still flow. But a lot of times it seems like now it's, you know, kind of in, in, a, in a resource curse situation where it's just being exported. It um, It's not so much about the local populations because you can make money off of other um, populations. So I was wondering, is there, like, is there, is there any, is there any country that's done that well? <laughs> like, um, any, any, in the, that's come into a resource in the past, you know, few decades? Huh? Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 I, no, I, fair it, enough. No, it's such a, it's a, because, so. Well, why did they do it well? Yeah, then? no, Dr. Like, Rose, it's such a good. Yeah. Yeah, and it, transparency. I think transparency is a, is a, it's a, it's a, so with a lot of these um, countries that are new to some sort of resource, right? So Ghana in this Big Men documentary, they explore this. We, we don't want to be subject to the resource curse. We're going to just implement the Norwegian model. And there's been some international petroleum scholars who write in this area, like, can you just take like, replication? So I take a model that seems to work really well in one country, and I just say, okay, what do they have? Oh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, gotcha. They have a license system, so the license is kind of like our lease for federal lands. We have permission, and then we pay a share of royalties. They got a lease system, perfect. We'll use that license system, and then bang, we're in Norway. You know, everything is just coming up roses. And the problem that these scholars have kind of examined is that you can't replicate the environment in which this sort of... Um, framework and policy live, that they're sort of inseparable. So here, one of the things in Norway is, well, I've got fair government. I have electoral you know, participation. I have a democracy. But maybe it's that we don't know that it will work in another country very well because the model is quite new, right? It's only been around since kind of the, I can't remember now offshore if it's 60s or 70s, but it's fairly new. And we haven't had a lot of opportunities to kind of um, implement it, w knowingly, kn knowing that this is the model we're going to implement. So a lot of it just goes to sort of transparency, fairness, 
justice, all of these sort of issues we kind of examine about why it might work in Norway and not work in a country, definitely not work in a country where there's already corruption in a lot of these sort of processes. But I think what's really interesting is that we even in, in the United States, we've adopted the Norwegian model on a state-by-state -state basis. You know, the U United States is one of the few countries where the states kind of have equivalent power. It's not just a centralized government, federal government. And so Norway, when they discovered, um, well not discovered, but when they began commercial development of the Bakken shale, decided, you know what, we're going to adopt the Norwegian model in terms of the sovereign wealth fund. And there's a terrific professor at West Virginia, Josh Verche, and he's written on the sort of implementation of the North Dakota sovereign wealth fund and how it was modeled after the Norwegian wealth fund. So maybe you can model certain aspects of it, but again, North Dakota, that's a pretty similar environment, you know, for... Or look at Alberta, which we had a heritage fund, right? And then if you have to look at, okay, well, not only do I have to implement the process, I got to manage the process, right? In Alaska, the money was put in. And there's a great scholar, um, you guys already probably know, um, Dr. Barry Rabe, University of Michigan, and he studies a lot of this work. He's got some really um, great research on it. It's a good question. Yeah, um, just building off that question. So talking about like how we can perhaps we it's not really feasible to cut and paste the Norwegian model into like countries such as Angola or Ghana that you talked about, how they have their natural resources but are still like you know sixty percent energy poverty or forty percent energy poverty because they haven't been able to implement within themselves because of the uh, resource curse. So not being able to use that model like one of the things that we were talking about is that we have to have transparent government, we have to have fair elections. But in countries where currently that is not the situation, do you think that the solution is an engineering solution, or do you think the solution is some, has to come from a, uh, a, a local origin, or there has to be some sort of outside party that needs to step in and say, hey, this can't go on any, any longer, because the, mo the longer this stays, the worse it gets for us? OK, I loved everything that you said. And I would propose it's your E. It's all of the above there. So the interesting thing about what, what is required, so what we're seeing internationally now, in order for you to be granted either concession or license, are the, um, it's the framework of how you operate internationally for oil and gas. And so in order to be granted that, and there, unlike most of the rest of the world, the United States is one of the few countries that has private mineral ownership, so you individuals can own, and about only 40% of our country is owned by federal, state, government tribes, right? And in most of the rest of the world, it's the government that controls the resources. So that's kind of an efficient, it's efficient for contracting purposes. So some of the solution is being done through commercial contracting and negotiation. So let's say you're an oil major, you're an international oil company, and you come to me, I'm the host government, and you say, okay, I want a license or a concession, I want to operate offshore, and here's my, my plan, it's going to be fantastic, I'm going to give you this share, it's going to be wonderful. And then I say to you, okay, that's cool, I want you to set up a power plant. I want you to set up an electric grid system. Or put in some kind of water system for my people. And so sometimes with these extracted and mining and oil and gas, it's the idea of corporate social responsibility. So some of it is coming from this idea of um, being a good corporate citizen, right, from a social perspective. Others, it's just coming from contracts. So in order to get the license, in order to get the concession, you have to do something because the country asks. And there might be another competing party who also wants the concession, who also wants the license, who says, yeah, I think it's worth this much to us to put this system in place. So I think sometimes you're seeing it as kind of a, a as a, as what's the word, a sort of coming together of government, of contract, of international, and also of technology, obviously, engineering. Right, so just to recap what you said, because um, when you say it, it sounds like a no-brainer. If I'm a major oil company and I go to Angola and I say, hey, I, I want a license, I want a concession to these resources, but in return, like, build 
a water purification system or, you know, a, a big power plant. So it has to be sort of like, you know, on both parties for like, you know, the government to say, hey, you, you need to do this. And whoever wants a license or, or concession needs to come say, okay, this will be a relationship that will be ongoing and will be like mutual to the, to the, to, to the both of us. Correct? Yeah, that's right. And we, we do that here too, right? We do that with sort of local oil, like not, not local, domestic oil and gas development, where a lot of oil and gas companies will invest in schools, fire departments, the idea of kind of giving back and, and being kind of a good corporate neighbor.